Morning, everybody. I hope you're doing okay and you've had a good week this week. It's great to be back doing another one of these this morning. Um, I was, if you were here two weeks ago, I had a few complaints after last time that I didn't hit that glass bowl hard enough with that hammer. So uh, I thought we could up the ante this week. Brought the chainsaw in. So, you know, keep an eye out for this later. Just be good to get a few sparks flying. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm messing with you guys. I wouldn't take a chainsaw to a bowl for the sake of a sermon illustration. Would I? Would I? No, 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 no. Don't mess with chainsaws at home, kids. But um, this morning, we are starting a new series looking at what the Bible says about living a changed life. Because one of the things that the last few months has done for all of us is expose some of the ways we need to change, hasn't it? You know, living under lockdown puts pressure on your relationships and it puts pressure on your mental health and on your work life and your family life. And the racial justice protests around the world are causing all of us to examine our own hearts. And whenever we think about life change, almost always we start to think about how we can improve some aspect of our circumstances, don't we? But the Bible says that a changed life, a really genuinely changed life, always comes from the inside out. It says that whoever you are, the change that God wants for you in your life is that you become a big hearted person, someone who just overflows with his love. That's the goal of your life from God's perspective. That's what he's aiming for. That's what he's calling you into and shaping you into through all of the circumstances of your life. And God is wanting to use this season to bring about that kind of fruitful change. Because to become a big hearted person is to step into a way of living that's courageous and free from anxiety and full of contentment and generosity. And it leads to overwhelming joy. And to live like that is what you have been longing for all your life. And one of the words that the Bible uses for that kind of big hearted life is generosity, generosity. And when we hear that word, we think about money, don't we? And generosity in the Bible isn't less than being generous with your money, but it's so much more because generosity in the Bible is this kind of radical big heartedness. It's something that overflows into all of life and it leads to joy. And in a few minutes, we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to help us step into that. You can step into that this morning. You can step towards that. And Jesus told a story about exactly this. It was a story about two very different guys, one of whom actually gave a lot of his money away, but he didn't have this kind of generous heart. And the other of whom was just beginning a journey out of selfishness and into joy, but whose heart had already started to change in just this kind of a way. Have a look at this for a second. This is from Luke's account of the life of Jesus. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week and give away a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And after Jesus' story finishes, the very next thing that happened, Luke says, is this. People were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them because God's kingdom belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And so what's this all about then? 
Do you know, Jesus is telling you where you'll find this kind of radical generosity, what it looks like and how to get it, where you find it, what it looks like, how to get it. So let's have a look at this together then. Come on. First of all, where you find it, because man, just look how different the two guys are in Jesus's story. You know, I mean, when we think of a tax collector, that doesn't exactly gladden our hearts, does it? But in Jesus's day, that was a terrible thing to be because Israel was occupied by Roman invaders who were basically ruthless and Roman taxes were huge because that was the way that they took all of the wealth of occupied nations back to Rome. And so they would collect these huge taxes at spear point with soldiers literally standing behind the Jewish tax collectors who were allowed to overcharge as much as they want and wanted and keep the difference. And so Jewish tax collectors were incredibly wealthy and incredibly hated. They were basically seen the way that Nazi collaborators were seen in occupied Europe during the Second World War. And they were also incredibly greedy. That's why they put up with all the hate, because they wanted the money so much. But then the other guy in Jesus' story is a Pharisee, and that's a word that's pretty negative for us because it's a word that's come to mean hypocrite. But in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were the good guys. They were religious reformers who really tried to live their faith out and who called on everybody else to do the same. And so, for example, they really did give away a tenth of their income like this guy. And that's a lot, isn't it? The average person in the UK today gives away 2% of their income, but this guy's giving way above that. This is someone who would have been seen as a pillar of the community. He would have been seen as a very generous person, a very admirable person. And so what you have in this story is two guys and outwardly one of them is a very selfish, greedy person and the other one is very generous. But Jesus says God doesn't see it that way. Jesus finishes his story by saying it's the tax collector who goes home justified before God. In other words, he's the one who goes home right with God. He goes home with God's favor on him and God's smile on him and on his life. And so how can that possibly be right? Do you know, Jesus is showing you that for God, generosity isn't something that's seen in a spreadsheet or a bank statement. It's seen in the heart. And what's in each of the hearts of these two guys comes out when they start to pray. Because the Pharisee's prayer is almost comically self-centered. Did you notice that? He starts his prayer by saying, God, I thank you. And, you know, when you thank someone, it's always for the things that they have done, isn't it? That's why you're thanking them, but not this guy, because the Pharisee starts by saying, God, I thank you that I'm better than everybody else. And then he lists off all of these things that he is giving to God and to other people and that he obviously thinks they should all be eternally grateful for. His prayer is basically along the lines of, I thank you, God, that I'm so amazing. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. And Jesus dials up the comedy when he says the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. Because in other words, he's saying the Pharisee stood up in the temple to worship and adore himself. It's a guy who adores himself and who looks down on everybody else. And so this is a guy who's kind of statistically generous, but he's not radically generous. He gives a lot of money away, yes, but wherever that's coming from, it's not coming out of the overflow of that kind of big heartedness because look at what his heart is like. He's self-centered and he's proud and grasping. But now on the other hand, look at the prayer of the tax collector because something very different is going on in his heart. The tax collector stood at a distance. The story says he wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Do you know what he's doing? He's asking for God's generosity because he's saying, I know I don't deserve this. I, I know my life is a mess and I've made some terrible choices, but I need your kindness, God. Please help me. Have mercy on me. And so can you see, this is a guy who's on a journey of heart change. He's only at the start and his life's still a mess, but already his heart is soft towards God. And 
Jesus says that's what God's looking for because that's the doorway into this kind of changed heart and this kind of changed life that you are longing to have and that God is longing to give you. And so what you have in this story is two people. One of them is technically very generous, but at the same time is actually very hard hearted. And the other one is technically very greedy, but something's happening on the inside that's already moving him in the direction of becoming big hearted. And Jesus says, that's what God's looking for. And so this is a pretty challenging story, but it's also kind of confusing because if giving your money away isn't the sign of real generosity, then what is? How can you know if you're growing in that kind of radical, big hearted life that God is looking for and that you are longing for? How can you know? What does that look like then? And it's really interesting that immediately after this little story, Luke tells us about the kids coming to be blessed by Jesus because on first reading, you sort of think, a bit random, because what's that got to do with what Jesus has just been saying? But Luke is showing you that the disciples have the same kind of issues as the Pharisee in Jesus' story. I don't know if you remember what Dominic Cummings said when he was explaining why he didn't tell Boris about his trip to Durham. He said, the most valuable commodity in government is the prime minister's time. Do you remember that? He was saying, look, when you work with powerful people, with powerful leaders, their time is valuable and how that time is spent really matters. And whether or not that was a valid excuse, just look at this, because the disciples must have gone to the Dominic Cummings School of Leadership because that's exactly their attitude. In Jesus, they've got a powerful leader on their hands and so they only want to leverage Jesus' time for stuff that really pays off. They only want Jesus to invest his time in things that really accomplish something. And so spending time with children, spending time with little kids who are of no significance and who can't do anything for you, why would Jesus ever do that? In their thinking, for someone like Jesus to spend his time on little kids is just extravagant because he's getting nothing out of it. It's not advancing his mission. It's not advancing his ministry. There's no payback. So why would he ever do that? And they were right. Jesus isn't doing this because there's some kind of payoff. He's doing it because it's generous. Jesus is doing it because he really has this kind of extravagant generosity and this kind of big hearted life. And the reason why his friends can't understand it is because they don't. They don't. And so here's Luke's point. You don't see this kind of big heartedness just in how someone uses their money. There's more than one currency for expressing generosity. And this is so important for us to understand. If you're a generous hearted person, you'll be able to see that in every area of your life. That'll find expression everywhere you go and in everything you do. If you're a radically generous person, you won't just be generous with the currency of money in your life. You'll be generous with all the other currencies as well. What do I mean? Well, what you see here is Jesus being generous with the currency of his time. I know lots of people and you know lots of people as well because you're probably one of them who are very happy to give their money away, but not their time. Your time is yours and you have your goals. You want control of your time. You don't like interruptions and all of that. Do you know, your privacy in that case is a more valuable currency to you than your money. You're happy to give your money away so that you can tell yourself you're generous, but if you're not willing to give your time and your privacy away, you're not radically big hearted yet because one of the main currencies in your life you're holding on to. I felt so convicted about that on lockdown in terms of how much time I really give to our kids. Or well, secondly, what about the currency of physical space, what we usually call hospitality? And I know the restrictions at the moment, but in normal life, do you let people into your home? Do you let people into your stuff? And do you get riled? If they mess all of that up, 
Are you the kind of person who gives their money away and who says, I'm a generous person, but you won't let anybody walk on your carpet? <laughs> Do you see? Or what about the currency of relationship? Because there are all kinds of people who really owe you, aren't there? There are all of those people who you've done a lot for and, and you really have. But have you really given away all of that help and all of that resource? Or do you have expectations now of those people that they'll pay you back somehow by kind of always having to express their thanks or by returning favours to you or whatever? Or have you really let all of that go? And then there are all the people who owe you just because they've done something bad to you. They've hurt you in some way or they've wronged you or cut you out. See, you're the kind of person who's happy to give their money away, but at the same time who holds a grudge and who can't forgive and who's still pouring over what happened five years ago and 10 years ago. Do you know, a radically generous person doesn't hold accounts like that in their relationships. They don't punish people. They don't hold things over people. They don't demand their rights. They don't demand recognition for all that they've done and for all of their service and all of their sacrifice. Do you see how challenging this passage is? Man, it's so challenging. So how are you doing with all of this? How are you doing with it? Radical generosity is about something much, much bigger than just money. Having that kind of big heartedness means living a whole life of giving rather than taking. It means living a whole life of self-donation and generosity because it comes out of the overflow, the continual overflow of a kind of a fullness in your heart. And this is the key because for most of us, the reason why we find it so hard to live like that is because we don't have that kind of fullness. We don't have that kind of overflow. We, we want to be big hearted. We want to be able to think of ourselves as generous, but actually what we're struggling with is an emptiness. And if you feel empty inside, if you don't like yourself, if you don't have this kind of overflow, you might be able to kind of force yourself to tick a few technical boxes like the Pharisee, but you won't be able to live a whole life of overflowing generosity. You won't be able to step into that way of life that's full of courage and contentment and that leads to joy. You won't. You'll either end up like the Pharisee, trying to fill that emptiness by chasing recognition and saying, look at everything I've done. Or you'll end up like the tax collector trying to fill that emptiness with money and possessions and power. You'll never live the big hearted life that you're longing for until you fill that emptiness. And so thirdly then, lastly, how do we get that kind of fullness then? And the answer's right here because that change begins for the tax collector when he asks for the generosity of God. Do you know the whole point of Luke's story is to tell you how God has given himself to you in Jesus Christ. Excuse me, it's to tell you that in Jesus, the generosity of God has now come and it's come to you. A bit later on when Paul, who's one of the first church leaders, is explaining this, he says, listen, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, look, Jesus had all the riches of the universe and yet out of love for us, he became poor. He came down among us and he made himself vulnerable. And at the end, he was stripped of everything. He was stripped of every possession, he gave it all up. He was even stripped of his life, but he did it all to secure your future, Paul's saying, so that you could come into true riches that will last forever. Look at his generosity. Through his death and resurrection, look at what he's done. Jesus has gone into your future and he secured it. And he did that so that you could be sure that in the end, all of the bad things in your life will turn out for good. Everything that you have in your life that's of true beauty and true value can never be lost to you. And for you, the best is yet to come. When you see just how comprehensively 
your future has been secured by the generosity of Jesus. When you see how much that cost him and how joyfully he gave that up for you, when you see the beauty of his generosity to you, you'll really change and from the inside out because it won't just be that you'll start to do a few more of the right kind of things through gritted teeth like the Pharisee. You'll start to become the right kind of person. Letting the beauty of God's love and generosity overwhelm you time and again like waves crashing on a beach. That's what leads to a changed heart and it's what leads to a changed life. That's what enables you to live a big hearted life that's beautiful for God and to live a life that's full of joy and generosity and sacrificial love. It always comes from seeing again the beauty of who Jesus is and what he's done and God wants us to enjoy another wave of that crashing over us this morning as we pray. See, if I could really step into that kind of heart change, and if you could, if we all could, then man, can you imagine what kind of church we would build? Can you imagine what kind of impact people like that would have on the city? A church that drank deeply of Jesus and truly lived all of this out, man, a church like that would change the world. It would. And that's what God wants for us. It's what he wants for our lives. It's what he wants for our church and for our city. So let's ask him, come on, let's do this. Let's go to him together and let's pray. Let's say, God, enlarge my heart. God, show me the beauty of what you've done for me. And if that is your prayer this morning, if you want to grow in seeing the beauty of what Jesus has done and in living a big hearted life, then while we're praying in the next minute or so, why don't you just join in with this by posting in the comments that prayer, Lord, enlarge my heart, enlarge my heart, God. Why don't you do that right now while I'm praying? Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We can just open our hearts to you in this moment. Oh, Holy Spirit, we just want to say you're welcome here and that we need you to show us the beauty of who Jesus is and what he's done. We're saying, Holy Spirit, please come and reveal more of Jesus to us right now in this moment. And Lord, you see our hearts. You see how tight and narrow and grasping we can be. And you have something so much better for us and so we're asking God, please come and soften our hearts right now by your spirit as we speak our prayers out, as we post our prayers. And we're praying, Holy Spirit, please come and pour out the generosity and the goodness of God into our lives and into our hearts in a fresh way. Reveal the generosity of Jesus to us in a fresh way and in the very deepest part of who we are. Show that to us, please. And God, we pray that you would enlarge our hearts in this season and you would enlarge the impact of your love in this city. That's our prayer, Lord. And we are asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys.